Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webcast, uh, part one of three of 40 years of the U.S. Department of Education examining its past, present, and future. Um, I want to give you a little background of why we're doing this, uh, and then we're going to get right into our panel discussion. But just so folks know, uh, originally what we were going to be doing was we we're going to have a conference talking about the past, present, and future of the U.S. Department of Education. It was going to be in person uh, because on May 4th, that is this coming Monday, it'll be the 40th birthday of the U.S. Department of Education. So we're going to have a big in-person conference for that. Obviously, uh, for reasons that everybody, I think, understands, uh, we weren't able to do that. So uh, for the next three days, it was really wonderful that we've been able to have all the people who are going to be panelists are going to be joining us now in a three-day sort of web series that will replicate what we are going to do in that conference, only you can watch from the, conference, uh, from the comfort of your own home. Um, so today, uh, we are going to be dealing with the first part of past, present, and future of the Department of Education, which is really focusing on why do we have a Department of Education? How did the U.S. Department of Education come about? Uh, and we're really uh, it's terrific that we have three uh, fantastic people to talk about this. Some of them were involved at the very beginning of the department. All have studied the department. Um, we will be starting with Christopher Quaros. And by the way, I'm just going to give quick bios so that we can quickly move into our program. If you want to learn more about them, there's lots of information um, uh, in the Internet about all of these folks. But very quickly, Christopher Cross, he's the chairman of Four Points Education Partners and the author of Political Education, National Policy Comes of Age. Uh, that was actually a book I read, uh, the the original edition. There's been a, at least two editions. Chris can tell me if there's more than that. But uh, just an incredibly informative book about how uh, federal education policy has evolved. Um, he was also the Assistant Secretary for Research and Innovation in the first Bush administration. Uh, then joining us, we have Ron Kimberling. He is the uh, Research Fellow at the Independent Institute and was the Assistant Secretary for Post-Secondary Education in the Reagan administration. And he has a new book that he's working on um, uh, called Memoirs of a Reaganaut. And uh, he may talk more about that. He will certainly talk more about uh, his experience at the Department of Education. And then finally, we are joined by Kevin Kosar, who is the Vice President for Research Partnerships at R Street and author of Failing Grades, the Federal Politics of Education Standards. Um, and as is the case for probably just about everyone, doing all these webinars and webcasting is sort of a brave new world for all of us, and we're always running into technical issues. So if we have technical difficulties, please bear with us. Um, and I'm sure anybody who's tried this knows how fragile this sometimes can seem. Um, uh, just a, one or two more things before we start. Uh, one, there is, you've probably seen, or you will see, a slight delay um, when people may respond to each other or respond to me. Uh, because of that, I will direct each person to talk, which may seem a little stilted, but it's the best way to make this move without a bunch of people talking all over each other and saying, I'm sorry, over and over. And that could eat up our whole time. Um, I encourage everybody to send questions. Depends on how you're watching. If you're on Twitter, you can send questions with hashtag Cato CEF. That's C A T O C E F. Uh, I believe if you're on YouTube, there's a box you can put on there. There's a Cato website, has a comment box, and all those questions will make it to me, and we're going to try and get to as many of them as possible. And so, with that, we will begin with Christopher Cross, and then after he's done, I will direct the next two panelists to speak. So, Christopher, all yours. Very good. Thanks very much, Neil. Um, as Neil mentioned, I was involved actually uh, working on the Hill at the time the department was proposed. So I think understanding some of the history of how it came to be and what the people in the issues were that framed the context for it is important. Uh, just begin a little with the history. Um, the, the department or education as a federal issue actually goes back to 
into post-Civil War time when it was briefly a department with a handful of people, then became part of the Interior Department, where it remained until Dwight Eisenhower created HEW in 1953. And actually mostly did data and uh, not much else uh, except the impact aid program until the passage of NDEA, the National Defense Education Act in 1958. And then of course, uh, Johnson and the Great Society programs in the mid sixties. Um, the department came to be almost um, major force being the National Education Association. Jimmy Carter, who ran, of course, in 76 against Gerald Ford, recognized the importance of having uh, the network of teachers out there across the country who are NEA members working on him, his behalf. So he went to the NEA and he pledged that he would support and promote the adoption of the new Department of Education if elected. Uh, he was elected, the NEA took credit, and not long thereafter, Carter uh, put forward a proposal for a uh, Department of Education. A little background about that. First of all, uh, the department is often referred to as the DOE. It is actually not. The DOE is the Department of Energy. Uh, and when Carter was considering his options here, he had many things including the creation of the Department of Energy. There was a team in an OMB who had the responsibility for putting together uh, proposals. The original options presented to Carter were very broad. They included moving uh, the Head Start program, moving the BIA schools, uh, the arts and humanities endowments, uh, all sorts of programs that spread across the government. In the end, he rejected almost all of those with the exception of the Department of Defense Overseas Schools. And we'll get back to that a little bit later. Uh, it was very controversial as a proposal. It was not unanimously supported by the education community by any means. In fact, Al Shanker, then the president uh, of the American Federation of Teachers, was a vehement opponent of the creation of the department, as was the higher education community, almost uniformly, the US Catholic Conference, and many other factors uh, who were involved with the education landscape. Their reasons were varied, but it had to do with feeling they didn't want the concentration of power at the federal level. And, and I think it's prescient if you look at today, there was concern about separating it from health and welfare would in fact lead to loosening of the links that needed to be made between those sectors in education. Now, when the, when the final Carter proposal went to the Hill, which would have been in 1977, um, it went to the Government Operations Committee, not education committees, because under the rules of both bodies, government organization is not a function of the substantive committees, it's an organizational issue. There was very organized opposition to the department in the Government Operations Committee. It was led by John Erlenborn, a congressman from uh, west of Chicago, and by Leo Ryan. He was a, Leo Ryan was a Democrat, Erlenborn a Republican. Ryan and Erlenborn were both a second ranking members on their respective sides of the aisle. Ryan represented uh, San Francisco area and had been in the California legislature where he had crossed swords with the uh, California Teachers Association, the NEA affiliate, and was vehemently opposed to the creation of the department. The two of those people working together were very effective in stalling it so that it never reached the, it never reached being an, uh, sent even to conference committee in the 95th Congress. And full disclosure, I staffed Erlenborn at that point and actually wrote a lot of amendments that worked their way into uh, the General Education Revisions Act and the department's authorization. 
Um, now there's an interesting sidebar to this, uh, which is not hardly at all understood and recognized. Lee O'Ryan, as I mentioned, was from San Francisco. That was the core of the group of people who went to Guyana in South America and created what was called Jonestown. Ryan was concerned about what was going on there. This was a cult. There's no other way to put it. It was a cult. Um, so Ryan went to Guyana after the elections in 78. And uh, this would have been November 78. Went into the camp. Uh, it was a small town of, um, turned out to be over 900 people. Talked to some people, made his way back to the, um, to, back to the landing strip with his aide, Jackie Spear, who is now a member of Congress and represents Ryan's whole district. And he was murdered on the landing strip. All of Jim Jones' followers were told to drink the Kool-Aid and the Kool-Aid was laced with cyanide. So if anybody ever tells you that they drank the Kool-Aid, ask them if it was laced with cyanide. Uh, Jackie Spear obviously survived, as did a couple of other people. 913 people died that day, 276 of them children. It was the largest loss of American civilian life outside the country in history. Now, the significance of this to the department is it meant the opposition on the Democratic side of the aisle went away. Jack Brooks, who chaired the committee, brought it again up in the 96th Congress. And at that point, he got it out of the committee by one vote. It was 20 to 19. It went to the House floor and it only passed the House by four votes. So that was a recognition of the controversy around it and the fact that there was not uniformity by any means. Um, after the uh, bill passed, it created a time for uh, organization, which was necessary to transfer people and the rest. And Jimmy Carter nominated a non-educator from California, a woman named Shirley Hufstetler, who was a lawyer in Los Angeles. I've talked to people who were in Carter's White House at that point. Nobody had any sense of why she was nominated. Um, of course, six months after um, the bill created the department, which was, as Neil mentioned, May of, uh, of 1980, six months later, Ronald Reagan was elected. And one of his planks was to uh, do away with the Department of Education. So the NEA uh, basically had a victory without a lot of uh, substantive over time, substance over time, because six months later it fell into the hands of what were the opposition to the department. Reagan appointed Ted Bell, who was the commissioner of education in Utah at that point, and Ted came to D.C. with uh, the understanding that he would create a proposal. Uh, so that's the background of why the department, of how the department came to be. The opposition were concerned about the fact that education would become too political. That certainly happened. That it would become too controlling and that it meant you would lose the connections between the health, welfare and other elements of the federal bureaucracy. So Neil, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Chris. Um, we'll be going to Ron in one second. I just want to remind everybody, if you have any questions, there are lots of ways you can submit them. And if you're on Twitter, make sure you use hashtag Cato CEF. We've got uh, several questions already in the queue. We will try and get to everybody, but if we don't, um, there will be lots of opportunity for you to rewatch this. Um, uh, so just keep those questions coming. Remember, use hashtag Cato CEF. And with that, over to you, Ron. Thank you, Neil. Um, Chris has taken us up to the election and inauguration of Ronald Reagan. What I would like to do is spend a few moments and talk about how the organizational culture of the education department came into being, how it was built. Uh, so I'm gonna cover at least the first two or three years of the Reagan administration and not give history beyond that. Uh, 
we can think of organizational culture which exists in the private sector and it exists in the government sector. But think about a federal agency. Think about the State Department and Foggy Bottom and the, the uh, diplomatic bureaucracy. Think about the FBI, which for many, many years, you only could wear white shirts, not like the shirt that I'm wearing. And uh, you had, uh, I have in my files, a 1960 memorandum from J. Edgar Hoover warning about the, uh, the spread of the communist conspiracy in the United States. And uh, you know, there were some real communists, but there were some uh, fake communists, if you will. So education, you know, most sub-agencies don't really have a organizational culture that the public is aware of. There is a culture within education that I think will be, uh, that it'll be in the background over the next couple of days of these webinars. Uh, but what caused it to be built during especially the first couple of years? I think there were three factors. The first Chris alluded to, and that was the separation of education from the old Department of Health, Education and Welfare. The second factor were some major organizational consequences of the Omnibus Budget and Reconciliation Act of 1981, referred to as OBRA. Uh, not Oprah, OBRA. And finally, Ted Bell's influence uh, with his appointment of a National Commission on Excellence in Education and the issuance of the so-called Nation at Risk Report uh, that came out in early 1983. So let's get into this a little bit. So first is what I call the divorce from education and HEW. Education was the E in, in HEW, Health, Education, and Welfare. It was called the Office of Education. Very importantly, the creation of the U.S. Department of Education did not create any new education programs. Most of them were lifted and shifted from HEW into the new agency, and others, as Chris mentioned, were transferred from some federal agencies, such as the Department of Defense Schools from DOD. Uh, there was a college housing loan program that came over from HUD, and too many to mention. Um, it was decided by that planning team that uh, Chris alluded to that the successor agency to HEW would be the Department of Health and Human Services, or HHS, which we're familiar with today. That was designated as the senior agency. What that meant is that there was a team of people representing the future HHS and the future education department that decided how to divide the pie. Well, it was easy to lift and shift the old Office of Education. It was easy to lift and shift the office under the then Assistant Secretary of HEW for higher education. It was uh, more difficult to separate staff offices, such as the general counsel, the, uh, the planning and, and budget uh, function within the agency, the Office of Legislation and Public Affairs. These are the non-programmatic offices that uh, administer the laws, keep the trains moving, uh, work with the Hill, and so on. Well, as the senior agency, HHS got the pick of the litter. So if you're looking at the career civil servants, the best, the brightest, the most talented and experienced ones went to HHS. Education was left with the basically... Uh, the, the ones that HHS did not want, they tended to be lower in seniority, they tended to be poorer performance. And so that handicapped education in terms of having really top-notch staff departments uh, under it. Um, there were uh, opportunities for the secretary under the Department of Ed Organization Act to abolish a few sub-agencies. Uh, this was not really exercised until Bennett came along, Bill Bennett, in 1985, and abolished the National Institute of Education and created uh, 
the new structure for the uh, assistant secretary's role that Chris occupied during the George H.W. Bush administration. Uh, Shirley Hofstadler, as Chris mentioned, was only education secretary for about half a year. She actually focused on some deregulation in, in some areas because that was a Jimmy Carter theme, believe it or not. Uh, she also focused very heavily on civil rights and the legal aspects of that, and that was part of her background as a lawyer and federal judge. Um, so that's where things started out when Reagan was elected and Ted Bell was appointed. Re as we remember, on March 30th, 1981, Ronald Reagan uh, was shot uh, by John Hinckley in a, an assassination attempt uh, that sent shockwaves in Washington. Reagan's recovery was cheered across the aisles. Uh, it gave him incredible political capital to work on his number one priority. His number one priority was to cut taxes and cut federal spending. He used to talk about the tax and spend liberals in Washington. So he was able to use that political capital and work a deal with the Democrats in the House, the Republicans had wrested control of the Senate, and come up with two bills. Um, so one of the bills was the Economic Recovery Tax Act, passed in August 13, 1981. It reduced the top marginal tax rate, if you can believe it, from 70% to 50% didn't have much of an impact on education. But the second bill was the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act, which set appropriations for the new fiscal year, 1982, which actually started in October of 81. Uh, there were provisions across the government and significant cuts in government spending as a result of OBRA. That act in education um, had three major provisions that affected the department. The first one is that it created a block grant. It abolished 33 separate programs in elementary and secondary education, mostly smaller programs, and consolidated them into a single block grant that went out to the states. This led to the abolition of 170 pages of federal regulations. Uh, spending for these programs was cut by $250 million. Doesn't seem like a lot today, but significant back then. And that was because of administrative cost savings from only having to administer one program, not 33. Um, there was a large layoff of employees that were put out of work as a result of uh, creating the block grants. That created a so-called RIF, or reduction in force, uh, made the union unhappy, led to suspicion uh, of the political appointees for many, many years to come. Um, the second major thing after the block grants was it transferred those Department of Defense overseas dependent schools back to the Defense Department. Chris uh, alluded to that when he talked about what was transferred into the department. Well, this one transferred them back out. It affected 267 schools, 250,000 students, and 8,000 employees, mostly teachers and principals in those schools. Uh, immediately, that cut the Department of Education's workforce by more than 50%. It didn't save the jobs, they went back to DOD, where they had been since 1821, if you can believe it. The third aspect of OBRA was that it reinstated a family means test for student loans. So up until 1978, to get a student loan, a student had to come from a family income of less than $25,000. Again, that doesn't seem like a lot, but in 1978, 25,000 was a significant income that put you into the middle class. Um, there was a bill also sponsored by the, uh, by the Carter administration called the MISA, the Middle Income Student Assistance Act, which took away that income cap completely. What was happening is that there was a significant thrust toward uh, 
changing the student aid programs uh, and creating a tuition tax uh, voucher uh, for families instead of the multiple student loan and grant programs the department uh, inherited. And uh, Carter opposed the tuition uh, tax credits. And uh, as a result, he decided, well, let's open up more student loans for more middle, middle uh, class families. Well, here's the catch. It resulted in a huge increase in loan volume in, in fiscal year 78 through 81. In 78, there were $1.9 billion worth of loans made. Uh, by 1981, that number was $7.8 billion. You can do the math on the exponential increase. The appropriations from uh, directly from Congress were 480 million in 78, 2.5 billion in 81. This was going up and up and up. Uh, there was a lot of so-called convenience borrowing, especially from higher income families, because without an income cap, they could afford to pay the college tuition at the time for their students, but they could either themselves or through their students borrow a student loan, which had a 7% repayment rate after the student graduated from college. And at that time, believe it or not, certificates of deposit and money market accounts were carrying 20% income rate, yeah, uh, 20% interest rates. So basically, there were a lot of people uh, that were making money off the student loan program with loans they didn't need. Let me move on. Finally, there's Ted Bell, The Nation at Risk. Most people have heard about that groundbreaking report, which was created by the National Commission on Excellence in Education, that Ted Bell had convinced the White House to uh, let, him, uh, let him go ahead with. Uh, and that report had some very uh, direct and stern language in it about the need for educational reform. It launched the educational reform movement. It established a role for the Secretary of Education at, on a bully pulpit, kind of leading the cheers for educational excellence and reform. That bully pulpit was picked up. Ronald Reagan made several speeches in his reelection campaign in 1984, and Bill Bennett uh, put it into overdrive when he finally became secretary. So in conclusion, there's a definite culture in education that was created by a combination of these events that took place between 1980 and 1983. And the main takeaways are the bully pulpit role for the Secretary of Education, a focus on economies and efficiencies in student aid, and targeting most of the funding in elementary and secondary education toward the two largest programs, uh, Title I, uh, which kind of levels uh, educational spending for poor families, and the Impact Aid Program, which covers the gap when large federal installations don't pay local income or local property taxes. A lot more to say in response to questions, but I'll wrap it up there. Great. Thanks, Ron. Over to you, Kevin. Well, hello, all. And um, I hope my audio connection holds up. Uh, before I start my remarks, I just want to note uh, something that Chris spoke of, which was the NEA getting involved in a presidential election. It was a really radical development. Um, the NEA is an organization that was chartered by Congress um, over 100 years ago. It was chartered as a professional group. It was not supposed to be a political group, and historically it had not been in, uh, in federal politics. Correctionally chartered entities as a general proposition and not to get involved in political activities. But when the NEA jumped in, it was a sign of the changing times in the politics of education. Now, <clears throat> Chris and Ron spoke of the creation of the department and its earliest years of operation. 
Uh, my own focus is on the broader issue of the Department of Education and how its existence transformed federal education politics. Creation of ED was a big moment. Um, it essentially rang the death knell for a very long national debate over the propriety of federal involvement in K through 12 schooling. Consider one point. 40 years ago, it was well within the bounds of political discourse to argue that we don't need a Department of Education. Today, anyone who takes that position is waved off as a libertarian or a troglodytic paleoconservative. Today, you cannot become a nominee for president by arguing that we need to get rid of the Department of Education. To fully appreciate how much federal education politics has changed, I just want to step back and put the ED uh, department in a larger historical context. So I'm going to break it up into three periods and it's broad sweep, um, but I'll be quick and please stick with me. Um, three periods, pre-1865 ed politics, 1865 to 1980, and then thereafter. Pre-1865, as a general proposition, it's fair to say that education, you know, it's always been valued in the United States. Jefferson put matters pithily. He said, if a nation expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization, it expects what never was and never will be. During this period, there was no question who had authority over education. It was parents and localities and eventually state governments, but that was only towards the end of the 19th century. When our constitution was drafted, there was no discussion of the federal Congress having authority over the schooling of the young. Article one, section eight of our national charter makes no mention of the topic. And the 10th amendment essentially notes that the powers not conferred to the federal government are reserved to the states. This is federalism and schooling the young was not the business of the feds. For much of the 19th century, this sort of strict constitutionalist perspective held. Congress limited its activities in education to requiring newly created states to establish schools under these land grants. And Congress also created some academies for soldiers and sailors, sailors at West Point and Annapolis respectively. Congress also created all of debt to serve best students and Howard University to train African Americans. But K through 12 education was not a matter that the federal government got into. Except in two instances, and these also coincided with the developing of, of the new period in education politics, post-Civil War. And that was schooling for uh, American Indians and also for newly freed blacks in the South. So, Period two is where we start to see national politics of education develop. Uh, after the Civil War, the political parties each started to take positions on them. Initially, it was Republicans who pushed for the feds to do something about education in the Deep South particularly. They're the ones who pushed President Andrew Johnson to sign legislation creating the first Department of Education in 1867. Um, they're also the ones who um, created the Freedmen's Bureau, which helped uh, establish and staff schools in the South. Democrats back then almost unanimously stood in opposition. After 1900, Republicans and Democrats switched their positions on the education issue, and it rose in salience, and you began to find education being a topic in presidential platforms, and presidents themselves were addressing the issue. Over the 20th century, it was like one slow inching forward after another of the federal government into K through 12 schooling. And all, in many of those cases, it involved uh, there being some sort of national emergency and an emergency being used as a justification for federal involvement. For example, high rates of illiteracy among the enlistees for World War I and the arrival of many non-English speaking immigrants was used to justify the creation of a federal vocational ed program. Citing another example, during the Great Depression, the economic calamities became a justification for getting the federal government into school construction policy and some direct instructional activities. Thus, over the 20th century, what we see is this rising of education, salience in federal politics, and also one side playing offense and the other side playing defense and trying to protect federalism. Uh, as we heard, 1980 marks the beginning of a new era because we have a Department of Education. 
Um, and it's my read that the department's arrival really cemented the federal role in schooling in a highly salient way. As Ron referenced, we now had a secretary of education who had a bully pulpit. This is the person who sat in the cabinet right there with the secretary of state, the secretary of defense, and et cetera. There were media who followed around this figure. Um, the federal role whereas it once had been kind of growing due to the appearance of various crises, now it was established. The department eternalized federal involvement in education. As mentioned uh, by Ron, Reagan initially ran against the Department of Education as a candidate. He campaigned against the growing role of the federal government in education. He spoke of sending responsibility back to the states for schooling and warned of creeping bureaucracy. He spoke the language of federalism, but the political winds were blowing against him. And the publication of A Nation at Risk sounded an alarm that there was a national education emergency. And logically, if there's a national emergency, there should be a national response. And lo and behold, we had a new national government agency which could lead the response on that. So abolishing the Department of Education, which was favored by some Reagan aides and many on the political right, soon became a non-starter. As it happened, Bob Dole in 1996 was the last Republican presidential nominee to advocate abolishing the Department of Education. After he was handily defeated, a young governor in Texas remarked to the media, quote, there's no question that from a per political perspective, Clinton stole the education issue and it affected the women's vote. Republicans must say that we are for education, end quote. So there it was, uh, the man who would become president after Clinton, George W. Bush, and who would uh, use federal power uh, to expand the federal role in schooling in the form of the No Child Left Behind Act. That was him saying the game is up on federalism. Thus it is today that both the Democratic and Republican parties conceive of the Department of Education as a fixture of the federal system and as a tool for advancing their policy interests. One side wants to use it often for pro-union activities and defending the public schools. The other side will try to turn it and foster choice and competition and charters and things like that. Federalism debate for the most part has been relegated to the extent of the language tacked onto the billions of dollars that flow in grants and aid from the department. Uh, say this is sort of institutional story and how it changes politics is not peculiar to the Department of Education. Um, we saw something similar happen in national defense where the country did not tend to keep a standing army around, not one of any size or consequence. But after World War II, we got the Pentagon and we got ever-growing spending on the military. Um, General proposition, I'll just close by saying that institutions matter. Uh, you create new ones, they're going to affect the politics and they're going to affect the operating assumptions of our governance system. And ED's development uh, was a huge, huge thing. And I dare say that anybody who was in politics in 1900 or 1950 probably would have had uh, very great difficulty in conceptualizing the possibility of there being a federal department of education. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Kevin. Um, uh, I have a lot of things I'd like to say, but uh, one of them is it's been pointed out to me that the acronym ED uh, for the Department of Education is unfortunate. I'll let anybody figure that out why. Took me a little while. Um, we have a lot of questions lined up, so I'm going to get to those very fast. And I'm going to ask the panelists to try and give as succinct an answer as you can to these. Uh, because we have a lot of the questions I'd like to get to as many as possible, and I will call on you by name. Um, the first one was I actually had a conversation on Twitter, and it was uh, the rare civil discussion on Twitter. Uh, and this person whose name was Todd R. Smith uh, and I, we were discussing, is there constitutional authority for a U.S. Department of Education? And my question is, was there much discussion about constitutional authority for a Department of Education when it was being debated, or was that not even an issue? And I'll start with Kevin, uh, and then I'll probably go in a reverse order of how our speakers went. So Kevin, you can go first. Yeah, yeah. When I 
doing my book on education, politics, and policy and my dissertation before that, one of the things that struck me about the history of federal education policy was that the language was explicitly constitutional. Um, you know, if we're talking about um, the federal government spending money to create schools for American Indian families, they point to the treaty power that's in the Constitution, and that's where this authority flows from. And then when it comes to questions about, well, what about other school kids uh, in America, they also point to the 10th Amendment. They speak to Article One, Section 8. So, yeah, the Constitution was a big deal in education politics, much of our history. Great. Ron? I'm going to defer to Chris on discussions on the Hill because I wasn't yet in Washington. But I would say it occasionally came up in very uh, unusual ways. Uh, for example, one of the major regional accrediting associations uh, had a subgroup uh, that accredited, a major subgroup that accredited high schools and elementary schools. They wanted federal recognition under the federal regulations. That, those regulations were designed for participation in higher education programs. And I argued vociferously, and I won the debate, that there was no constitutional justification for the department to get involved in recognizing accreditation in elementary and secondary education. Thanks, Chris. You know, memory, it's been a long time, um, Neil, but I don't remember specific conversations around this issue that were overshadowing the discussion in 77, 78, 79, um, it really was around the politics of it. And the degree to which some said that wasn't an issue, they point to the general welfare clause of the constitution, which gives the federal government the right to be, uh, be mindful of the general welfare of the population. But I don't think, it, my recollection, not a big issue. Uh, well, that's disappointing to me. Um, but actually, the general welfare clause and the necessary and proper clause were what uh, Mr. Smith and I were discussing. Um, I actually don't think either one of those justifies involvement in education. Um, but I'm just the moderator today. I would also just say, though, they only introduce why we have specific enumerated powers. Education's not among them. Uh, that's my editorializing. Uh, I will say that we have a lot of questions lined up. Some of them we may keep till tomorrow, which is going to focus on what Ed, the Department of Education, has actually accomplished. Um, so if we don't get to some of your questions today, uh, we will tackle them, uh, those that are about what has the department accomplished tomorrow. Um, but this is an interesting question, an important one, because um, you know, roughly during the time the Department of Education was being established and debated, we were still talking about desegregation, a federal role in desegregation. And Leon wants to know, uh, is there an opportunity for the Department of Education to address what amounts to de facto resegregation of public schools? And so part of that, I think, is how important was having some entity to sort of take charge of desegregation and education? How important was that for the forming of the department and the, the uh, thinking of why you would form a department? And we'll start with Ron now. Um, I again, we'll defer to Chris on uh, discussions on the Hill. Uh, I believe, and he can correct me if I'm wrong, that there was a civil rights office within HEW. Certainly with the creation of the department, there became uh, a civil rights office. There was a backlog of state uh, civil right lawsuit, rights lawsuits, some of which had gone on for uh, 10 or 15 years or more. And uh, one of the things that Ted Bill did early on was he worked with his assistant secretary for civil rights, uh, a young man named Clarence Thomas, uh, who uh, uh, they worked assiduously to clear out these backlogs and come to settlement agreements. I remember North Carolina being one of them. Um, uh, 
So that was that was one aspect. The other thing is that Clarence reorganized his uh, uh, work procedures within OCR. And uh, in the past, virtually every complaint of discrimination had been fully investigated. Clarence came up with a way of triaging uh, complaints and doing kind of an initial probe to see if there was anything there there. And he focused his investigation tools on serious acts of discrimination as opposed to what were just prima facie evidence suggested they were false claims. So those were some things going on in the department. Uh, Chris, do you want to speak to whether or not there was a, a debate about desegregation or a goal to create the department to help foster desegregation? Um, not specifically. There are a couple, couple of uh, kind of scene-setting things here. Uh, I went into the department of HEW back in 1969. Oh and uh, worked on education issues for Elliot Richardson when he was the secretary. And one of the programs that actually Don Rumsfeld transferred to uh, the Office of Education was something called the Emergency School Aid Assistance Program, later the Emergency School Aid Act, which was aimed at providing federal money for the desegregation of dual systems in the South very uh, unappreciated in terms of its impact. Richardson mandated that applications from these uh, districts had to be turned around in 24 hours and payments made. And it probably had more to do with accelerating the, the segregation of these dual systems in the South than anything. And, um, Early on in uh, the Nixon administration, you may remember that the uh, director of the Office of Civil Rights in HEW was Leon Panetta, who went on for many other things after that. Um, but it was always understood, I think, that education would have its own Office of Civil Rights and it would pick up the mantle from what the old uh, HEW Office of Civil Rights handled. Great. Kevin, anything you want to add to that? Do we have Kevin? Let's see. If not, we will. All right. Um, we will return to that if Kevin, uh, if we get him back up. Like I said, technical difficulties are part of the brave new world. Wait, I heard something. Kevin, is that you? Okay, well, I'll just move on to the next question. Hopefully, we get Kevin back. Hey, Neil, soon. yes, I'm back. Um, oh, great! Did you did you hear the question? Yeah, sure did. Um, Jimmy Carter was uh, kind of a tinkerer of mind. He liked to create new stuff. He created Department of Education, Department of Energy. Uh, he had all sorts of new initiatives, and I, you know, I think that's one of those things that was in the mix, um, in addition to the other factors mentioned. Great. Um, so I have a multi-part question from Michael via Facebook. Uh, I'm going to save some of it for tomorrow because, it, as he surmised, actually part of his question will be dealt with tomorrow. Um, but he asks. Uh, will we be discussing today how the department was formed to help students with it ed with education? And it's an interesting question, I think, because we talked about uh, how it was a lot of prodding by the National Education Association in particular to create a department. How central in the discussions about creating the department was was were students were student achievement, or was it more about um, and more explicitly about uh, how political power would be uh, centralized in one place? Or was it really mainly about what is the best way to help students? And we'll go to Chris, I think. It was much more around political power. And remember my description of the controversy here with the NEA and around the other elements of the education community in opposition. Um, the question of 
what would happen here in terms of student support certainly was a factor in the NEA. One of their major reasons, of course, for proposing it was they also thought as a department that you get a lot more money. And over time, that probably has turned out to be rather than the smaller amounts it had in HEW. So to that degree, yes, uh, student uh, ach achievement and student support was a factor. Remember, uh, the predecessor to IDEA had been uh, created only a few years before the creation of the department. And that was a major factor in terms of in increasing federal budgets. Um, but no, I would not say that it was an overriding theme. The politics was much more important. Great. Kevin? Yeah, in this era, the education really conceptualized as a problem of resources, uh, the money not being where the kids are at, as one political put it at the time, and certainly creating a Department of Education um, made it much easier to increase spending because you have a, an entity that now gets to go through the appropriations process. And it's going to be led by somebody who's an advocate, somebody who's going to say, give me more money. And at that time, we also have to remember that there was a very strong Democratic control of Congress. Um, so, you know, you knew appropriators were going to give you more. Um, so, yes, uh, this was to some degree about helping the kids, but helping the kids meant asking for a lot more money. Mm -hmm. uh, Ron, let me ask sort of a, a permutation of this. So uh, in the Reagan administration, as you mentioned, you get a nation at risk. Uh, as I recall, the Secretary of Education, it may have been started with uh, Bell, or, but I think it was Bennett, but had a, a big tracker of state test scores. Uh, under the Reagan administration, do you think that there became more of a focus on educational outcomes rather than uh, inputs in the department? Absolutely. Uh, and I will get a little bit into the Bennett years, but uh, let's roll the clock back. The decline in educational performance was not as severe back in 1980, 81 as it is today. The U.S. was still at or near the top of the list in international educational performance uh, measurements. Um, the apogee for SAT scores came in either 1966 or 67, and they hadn't fallen off so much uh, by, by the early 80s. So I would say there were discussions, particularly in the states, at, in localities, about educational performance of students, but it was Ted Bell and the Nation at Risk report that really put their arms around it and launched it onto the national agenda. Uh, Bennett continued this. Uh, and by the way, the uh, report cards for schools was started late in Bell's term of office, and it was improved upon by Bennett uh, to provide you know, state statistics on educational performance. Bennett also, he focused on areas of curriculum, like his James Madison High School proposal, which had a traditional core curriculum. Uh, you could see that as the beginnings of the Common Core. Uh, and certainly, uh, there were a number of libertarians and conservatives who were quite concerned about the federal government beginning to, uh, even though it was just a suggestion, beginning to dictate curricula. Uh, as the solution for educational performance. Great. Thanks, Ron. Chris has something real quick we'd like to say, and then uh, we're going to try and get two more questions, and it'll have to be kind of a lightning round. Chris, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Ted Bell did create something called the wall chart, which was the first attempt to really lay out the data. And he did it because of a feeling that governors and states weren't paying attention to the quality of education. And that began the whole issue of uh, showing the real story. Great. 
Thank you. Um, so we have a comment from Pam that uh, on YouTube, uh, which leads to a question. Again, let's go. We'll try and go lightning round. I think we have about five minutes left. Um, she says that having HHS take the brightest people is the antithesis of what's needed to form uh, education platforms in the U.S. to be competitive in the world. Um, and uh, my question that's connected to that is, did that uh, having sort of the the not best employees um, when Ed started, did that lead to any sort of permanent handicapping of the department or did it eventually get up to speed? Oh, and we'll start with uh, Kevin. Uh, actually, I'm going to pass that one on to Ron and Chris, who's probably better positioned to answer. Okay, on to Ron. Um, I think, uh, first of all, we have to make a distinction between the transfer of employees who administered the educational programs. As I indicated earlier, they were lifted and shifted. So you still had the best and the brightest. I had, for example, the deputy director of the international education programs prepared Ronald Reagan for his trip to China in 1984 and even gave him a few words of Chinese to say because he had been the head of the uh, foreign language and, and international studies program at Georgetown University. So we had some high caliber people like that in the program areas, but the lawyers and the budget people, they were difficult to work with. The political appointees were fine. They were good solid appointments but they had to work with people who were slow thinking bureaucrats. And from the perspective of the program offices, uh, it caused a slowdown and it impeded progress in some of the Reagan initiatives, not for political reasons, but simply bureaucratic inertia. Thanks, Chris. Nothing. Okay, great. Uh, well, that leaves us then time for one last question, which I think is interesting. Thanks for everyone who sent questions. I'm going to try and get to the ones that are about the performance of the department. Uh, more of those tomorrow. So just hang on and join us tomorrow from one o'clock to two o'clock. But uh, there's a question that comes from somebody who didn't leave their name, but it's a really excellent question. Uh, they said they're basing their comparison on or they're basing it on a rough comparison between Germany and the U.S. And they're wondering if in the formation of the department and the thinking behind the department uh, was part of the intention to distance our education system or system from one that was based more in uh, shaping people and training people for a trade and more toward college and university as opposed to a German model that may have had more emphasis on preparing people to to uh, to be skilled tradesmen as opposed to going to college university? Was there any sort of thinking like that driving creation of the department? Uh, and we'll start with Chris. I don't recall any discussions along those lines at all. Uh, this was, of course, far before the time when college for all became the major issue as driven by Gates Foundation and many others. But at that point, um, that was felt to be much more an issue of states and what their policies were. And I, I just have no recollection of that being a major issue in the formation discussions. Ron, did that come up at any time while you were at the department? Not in that uh, way. Uh, if you met a, a presidential appointee from the department, uh, all through the uh, 80s, uh, and they were asked a question like that, they would say, we do not have a ministry of education, first thing out of their mouth. And they would basically celebrate the potpourri of choices that people can make both early in their lives and later in their lives in a higher education or a vocational training track and could point to numerous examples. So it really was... Uh, Occasionally, when we had this international perspective come up, it was a defense of uh, free choice in America. Kevin, anything you want to add to that? 
Yeah, that's right. I think the um, diversity of American schooling was integrated into the Department of Ed. Um, you know, back then, you, you had high schools that would teach kids automotive mechanics. Um, shop was something everybody took and home ec too. And it wasn't until the standards movement came in the mid 80s, it started to blossom that we started to take the attitude that every kid needs to have a rigorous curricula to prepare him or her for college. All right, thank you, and thank you for the brevity of those answers. I think we got a lot of good stuff in there. Uh, I want to thank everybody who has joined us today on all the various platforms. Uh, I want to thank especially our panelists. I'd say give them a round of applause, but they can't hear it other than if I clap, so good job. Um, but I'm sure there's clapping all over America. Uh, if there are questions that you submitted, again, I'm sorry. Some of them I just couldn't get to, but many of them are... Uh, ultimately most appropriate for tomorrow's panel, which will be at the same time, one o'clock Eastern time. Um, we'll have more great panelists. I'll actually be a panelist, so we'll have two great panelists plus me. Um, and we'll be talking about what has the department accomplished. And so many of these questions are uh, ideal for that. Uh, and um, you can re-watch this uh, panel that we had today. It'll be on many platforms. You can watch it on Cato.org especially. Um, and so uh, thanks to everyone and we will see you tomorrow.